So my name's Tim Jackson. I uh, direct a research group in, in the UK, which is called the Centre for Understanding Sustainable Prosperity. I suppose the starting point is that we live on a finite planet. And that finite planet has finite resources. And we never know exactly um, when we're going to run out of those resources. We never know exactly what the thresholds are when we throw things away into the environment and destroy those resources. Uh, but what we do know is that human society is having a huge impact on the integrity of our ecosystems, on the supply chains of uh, scarce resources, on um, forests, on biodiversity, huge losses of biodiversity over the last quarter of a century even has been quite extraordinary. And that that process is driven, broadly driven by uh, a growth-based economy. So there, you know, in, in a nutshell, is the problem, is, you know, growth-based economy, finite planet, uh, it's almost obvious, it should be almost obvious that they don't quite commute, uh, they don't quite compute. And um, <coughs> the economists will try and get around that by saying, well, you can grow the economy in value terms without pulling resources through. But the reality is we haven't done particularly well at achieving that. And the growth-based economy is still degrading resources, still causing climate change, still polluting oceans, still uh, undermining the quality of soil, still attacking biodiversity. And we don't, um, we don't have the right structures in place, we don't have the right economy in place, we don't have the right society in place to, to square that circle. And that's really the call. The call is to think differently about the economy. Um, bringing into the frame the fact that we live on a finite planet. The, the thing that, that start, certainly in my case started me thinking about it was um, ecological reasons that uh, human society is having unacceptable impacts on um, the planet itself, on the health of other species, on uh, the, res the resources that it needs to sustain itself. But when you start to think about that, you begin to start to think about the internal reasons why a model based on continual growth just doesn't work because we're kind of sitting on a branch of a tree sawing it off and not realizing that actually we're on the outside of the branch and the whole thing's going to crumble because we have no longer the resources that we need and we don't have the environmental services we can't rely on them in the same way and and so there's kind of a it, it, it isn't just about the planet, there are kind of internal contradictions as well about how society works. And there are social reasons why just having more and more stuff isn't necessarily uh, the be all and end all of development. And some of those social reasons are, are um, really clearly brought home to us by the fact that the growth based society has presided over huge inequalities. So lots of people have more than enough. And, and many, many more people have not even the basics for uh, a decent life. And that's, 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 all been, um, that's all been carried out, that's all been delivered under the basis of, of let's just grow and grow and grow and then everything will be all right for the poorest. Uh, we'll solve the technological problems with, with clever technology. We'll substitute when we run out of resources. We'll fix the climate somehow. And um, the messages, I think, from, from the last years, the last decades, uh, but in particular the last years, is that we simply haven't achieved that. And what's more, we, the economy's kind of broken in its own terms. We have since the financial crisis, the degree of financial instability that we don't know how to fix. We have low growth rates, low productivity growth in the economy. So you, have, you really have ecological, social, and economic, basic economic reasons that the, the growth-based model um, isn't delivering what it should be delivering, and is in many places undermining the quality of our life. This comes back in a way to the idea that the, the economists would say to you, well, the economy itself is not about stuff. It's about value. It's about economic value. And there's no reason why 
we can increase that economic value, continue to grow, in other words, in economic terms, but use less material stuff. So if you like the sense of decoupling, decoupling economic growth, the value side of it from its material basis. And uh, I mean, the first thing to say about that is it's a really good idea. Um, as much of that as we can get, we definitely want, and we have a number of ways to think about it. We can substitute renewable energy for fossil fuel-fired energy. We can make our material systems much, much more efficient. We can reduce the material intensity and the chemical intensity of agricultural systems. And we can do, we can do all of that work in ways which will deliver more economic value for less ecological impact. And, and, and that's got to be a good thing. But the challenge of it really is that we we're still sitting inside a system that's driving itself towards expansion, which means that we have to run faster and faster in order to reduce, offset the impact of the, of the economic expansion that we're engaged in. It's a little bit like uh, you, you're, you're, you're trying to run up a, a, an escalator, um, a, a moving stairway, but the trouble is the stairway's coming down in this direction, and the faster you run in that direction, the faster it moves down in this direction, and actually, quite a lot of the time we just we don't catch up we don't we don't reduce our environmental impact we we can't move fast enough in technological terms um, to reduce the overall impact as the economy continues to expand and that's the point where you have to start to question the model itself we might have lots of clever technologies we might be able to achieve a certain amount of that decoupling but being able to do so in a system that prioritizes material goods and prioritizes the production of those goods in order to pursue a profit-based model of, of competitive industry um, and expand the possibilities for our lifestyles even in the rich Western economies forever um, is one that's always going to struggle to reduce its impact on the planet and, and again it's a combination of ecological uh, social and and indeed economic and financial reasons why you have to end up looking at, at shifting that model of how we understand the economy. Yeah, I think, I think it, it is a place where transformation is what you're looking for. Um, and that transformation, to some extent, you could think of as almost as revolutionary because you're, you're, change, you're transforming things so much. Um, but you can only start from where you are. You know, we live in a system with a particular characteristics and what we have to identify if we want change is the appropriate avenues that you can pursue now in order to make that change. And I, and I think that's, a, to me, that's a, a very precise, very definable, very manageable task. And it has a variety of co components. Some of them are basic economics. What, what, does the, what are the implications for the kinds of enterprises that you have in this transformed system? And, and you, you ask that question. And when you ask the question, then it becomes actually rather clear that these enterprises must deliver social goods, health and welfare and nutrition and clothing. Um, and they must deliver, they must deliver it with, with high levels of employment and they must deliver it with good quality outcomes. And if, if, if you're trying to change the environmental impact, then you've got to do it with very, very low impact. And so immediately you're drawn towards, if you like, a sketch of, of, of the enterprise of the future, uh, which is very, very different from the, the, the kind of mass production manufactured model of, of linear throughput that we've had in the past and is much more associated with the concept of delivering service, delivering health and delivering service. Um, so that's what does enterprise look like? You can ask the question, what does investment look like? Now investment in our slightly broken economic system has been a way of um, extracting value for shareholders, firstly out of high quality resources, secondly out of people's lives, supply chains, and thirdly out of uh, um, the sort of appetite of consumers really to have more and more stuff. It doesn't work. It's clearly a part, that investment model is clearly a part of what's wrong. And so when you start to think about investment, you then can again restructure that very, very clearly. Investment has to be seen as a process of um, protecting, building and protecting the assets on which our prosperity depends in the future. So it, it's, it, 
I suppose the point I'm trying to make is that you can, you can go through these economic fundamentals, enterprise, investment, work, the money system itself, and you can systematically identify actually what you need to happen to each of those elements to, to transform this model itself. And, and ultimately, you also want to know that you can fit that back together again. So there's a kind of, there's a, uh, you know, hard macroeconomics task. What does your economy look like when it's not growing anymore? How do you protect employment? How do you protect financial stability? Uh, what does your financial market look like? How does your money system operate? And you can begin then to put those pieces back together. And it's a puzzle really that is definable, manageable, um, but very much in its infancy because we've really not had anything in the way of a, of a plan B. We've always assumed that we can just fix all this stuff with growth. And I think my work in a way is just a kind of call to arms. You know, this, this is not working, this growth-based system. Let's systematically address these issues. Let's put some effort into reconceiving those systems. And that's the basis for then delivering a different kind of economy. That's the transformation. I think, um, the, the, the position of the individual in this is, is, um, is really interesting. Um, a lot of the work that, I, that my research group has done in, in the UK has been about looking at, at individual lives and the, the ways in which those lifestyles change, can change, do change, and the, and the ways in which it's very, very difficult to change. And it's a kind of a paradox because when you look at it, you see a set of people who with commitment have made extraordinary changes in the right direction, in the direction that we would say is socially good. They've dematerialized their lives, they drive less, they travel in different ways, they invest in different ways, they, they're less materialistic generally, they bring up their kids with different values. Uh, sometimes they live completely outside the system in order to do that because it's very hard to achieve in the system. And those are real experiences of real people and that's one of the lessons that you, when you look at them you begin to see that that is possible not only is it possible but sometimes actually and this is, this is a fascinating point those people are measurably happier for having made those choices because they're living in accordance with their values does that mean that you know everybody's going to make that choice? No. Does it mean that you can persuade everybody to make that choice? No. There, it, it, does it mean that those people in themselves are always successful? No. And, and there's the reality of it, is that, that we are living inside a system in which it's very, very hard for people to make that choice. And that's the point, I think, where you begin to have to look beyond individual choice and towards the structures of society. And of course, it's always an interaction between individuals and society. Society isn't a, a kind of completely concrete, unchanging thing. And individuals are not all powerful, but somehow the interaction of individual choice and the structures that we live in is capable of change. Uh, and that's the point where I think, you know, there's a lot of motivation for people not just to change their lives, but actually to work actively for the change of the structures in which we live, to campaign, to be activists, to get out there and say, actually, you know, a better life is possible and this is how you could, in fact, do it. So to me, it's, it's, um, it's, it's a balance, it's a, it's a symbiosis um, of the possibilities for individual change and the necessity for structural change.